Hi, my name is Jared Bendis. I am the Creative New Media Officer here for the Calvin Smith Library here at Case Western Reserve University, which is all that fits on my business card. But today I'm here to talk to you from another role, because I wear actually multiple hats. I'm also a game design faculty at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And what's been really fun for me is that over the past few years, the game design program has gone through uh, an evolution. For a lot of people, when they think about game design, they think about game art. And for, for many years, that's really what the program was. But the problem is, is if you're going to major in game art, you should major in not game art. You should major in illustration or animation or other types of things. So we said, how do we evolve this program? And we looked at the, the program a couple of years ago, and we realized was the students didn't actually make any video games into their junior year. It seems a little late to really start working in your major. And even worse, they were only told that they could make these video games in collaboration with Case Western computer science students. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm pretty keen on collaboration, but I want these kids learning their fundamentals earlier. So we said, how can we redesign the program? And we actually, what I'm going to tell you about is sort of the first year of the new program, but we're in the second year of the new program and it's working just fine. So anyway, so what is a game? Now Mace is laughing because we have presented multiple times on the theory of what is a game. For us, however, I don't mean that in the traditional sense. I mean, what is a game when I ask my students this? And of course, this is what they all think of. They all think of Grand Theft Auto V, which is great because this is what I show their parents when their parents go to me and they go, my kid's going to major in video games. What does that mean? And I go, well, this game made in the first 48 hours one billion dollars. That's, that's, that's how big this industry is. It made a billion dollars in its first 48 hours. Now, that's a really exciting number. That means that this is a real industry. That's not a fluke. That's actually what happens. The problem, of course, is it took 250 million to make the game in two and a half years. See, game design is a team sport. But the problem is, is you don't learn team sports by just playing team sports. you got to start somewhere. And most teachers, most educators, when they approach these things, they're like, all right, everybody, uh, you don't turn to a third grader and go, all right, let's start with your dissertation. Well, that's what you're going to make. No, so we have, how do we start them slow? We start them a little slow. So I'm like, all right, so how do I get them to go from this uh, to this, right? Let's, do, let's start really, really easy. Let's go with a nice little small game. So I go, what's in between rock, paper, scissors and Grand Theft Auto V? And then I thought back to my childhood, which is a long time ago now that I'm thinking about it. And I'm thinking arcade games, when games were games. And some of you are like going, yeah, because you don't make arcade games. There was risk involved here, right? Risk, actual risk, quarters. Quarters, you had to put a quarter in. Can you, know, can you imagine uh, what our kids today would do if there actually was a real world risk involved in their gameplay? Because, I mean, I mean, there's in-app purchases, but that's just addiction. I'm talking about risk, actual risk, when these, before these things were slot machines. So we designed a whole new curriculum, actually designed two courses. Uh, right now I'm in the middle of the first semester course, so now the, the sophomores start making games. In the first semester of their sophomore, uh, their sophomore year, they take a game called Introduction to games, and that is we develop board games and card games. Uh, it was really great because when I pulled the audience, they pulled the students, why are you here? They're all like, because I want to make video games. I'm like, that's the spring. They're like, oh. But then they all stayed because they, they like the idea of making board and card games. And we start really, really small. So we start really small, and what we're going to start off here is with the idea of how I teach designing of games. We design the world the people, the scenarios, and the interactions. And if any of you have been involved with software design, this is the proper way of designing software. You design the world, the people, the scenarios, and the interactions. But I basically narrow down all of this into one simple sentence. You're a blank and a blank trying to blank. This is it. This is all we teach in game design. Can you put it down in these basic components? It's storytelling, right? You're a blank and a blank trying to blank. So now we're going to expand the number of blanks in a moment, and we're going to go through what I call the golden age of arcade games as a curriculum. Now, uh, last spring I had 13 sophomore students. Those 13 sophomore students were required to design for me three games each. So instead of coming out of their junior year with three giant collaborative games, they, they walked out of their sophomore year with, as a class having developed 39 games. 
There weren't 39 good games, but then again, there aren't 39 good papers coming out of a class either, but there were some quality stuff. Now, I've, I've actually learned some new vocabulary as I'm in grad school again. I'm, I'm getting my MFA in modern dance. And uh, one of the things that you learn is, is that in, in, every time I'm in class, I'm not making a dance. Oh no, it's not a dance. It's not a dance. It's not a dance yet. They use a great term. It's a study. And I love that term because I call them games, but really they're studies. They're fun, they're entertaining, but are they the full-fledged? And that's what kind of makes arcade games fun, especially in the golden age. Because the, the, when you look at an arcade game from the golden age to something like now, do they feel like the game? No, they, they're smaller, they're bite-sized, and they generally were designed by one person. So we start, oh, one last thing. I have to make sure that we don't just talk about art and mechanics. I want to make sure I throw this last slide in before I go on, and that is every game needs balance. And I always throw this in because balance is, another, is a fancy word for hope. Every game needs hope. I'm teaching my students to design hope. What keeps you playing a game when you're getting your butt kicked? Hope. And that's a really important thing because a game without hope isn't a game. That's why kids hate school because they don't have any hope. Right? But the kids who love school have hope. They hope that they're going to be able to use it. They hope they're going to do well. Um, so I want to always throw that in there real fast. Now, one last little caveat before I get to that first project is to seed this idea to my, uh, my sophomores in their spring semester. I give them one last project in their first semester of their sophomore year. And I say to them, I want you to dream of a video game. Think of it more like Mario Brothers. I want you to think of a video game. And I want you to make me a video of that video game being played. So there's no programming here. And I don't even give them any training whatsoever. They already have taken foundations. They already know how to make art. They already know how to make videos. So what I tell them is very simply this. I want you to go out using the, and I give this the last day of class. I say, I'll see you in two weeks of the final. Show me your video. So I'm going to show you one little example of what kids come up with with this sort of video. They're required to have a title screen, an instruction screen, um, and a little bit of gameplay. Double jump. Pause it there. This is not one of my best students. She knows this, by the way. Actually, I'm not saying that in a bad way. Actually, my most disapp mostly disappointed in her is that she never made this game. You're not looking at a video game. You're looking at a video of a game that doesn't exist. And that's part of this exercise is I want to make sure you realize we spend a lot of times having these kids visualize what they're going to build before they build it. And even the worst of the videos, which this isn't one of the worst of videos, it's actually one of the better videos. But even the worst of the videos looked like you were watching a bad video game being played. It still felt like you were watching a video game being played. And that meant that they were truly visualizing play. But let's move on to the game. So we start with Space Invaders. That's where we start, right? That's the beginning of like modern arcade games. And let me break it down a little bit. You're a hero. That's you, your spaceship. In a world, which is like space, shooting hero projectiles or bullets at enemies, the invaders, shooting enemy projectiles, bullets, while optionally or attacking or defending a base, yours or theirs. That's this, the sentence that my students have to fill out. Here's an example of that sentence filled out. You're a porcupine in the woods, shooting quills at raccoons that are shooting pine cones while uh, defending yourself. So this is Space Invaders. It's what's called a rail shooter. You're on a rail, they're on a rail. You actually never touch the bad guy. Now, here's the funny part. Will Prezi allow me to launch the link properly? So cross your fingers. Are the demo gods with me? It looks like they are. Worst thing you can ever do in front of an audience is play a video game in front of them, so let's do it. Um. Uh-oh. See if I can beat the level. It's only one level. It's pesky pine cones. 
All right. P apparently, it's not going to happen. All right, let's go back. You can do it. Again. You can do it later. They're online. That was done by one student. That was one, part one of three in the semester. And again, we set the mechanic, rail shooter. We set the idea, space invaders. They built the story, they built the graphics, and then they tweaked the gameplay until it was uh, fun. And actually, one of the funnest examples is that some of the worst art or some of the stupidest stories are the ones that when we play test these, people adore. They love playing it. They keep going, that's the one I want to play. And I go, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to define fun. People define their own sense of fun. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, part two, Pac-Man. Still the most popular game of all time. Literally, it's like the most popular game of all time. And it was designed uh, by the designer because the designer knew that women traditionally didn't like shoot 'em up games. So he said, I'm gonna make a game that doesn't involve any shooting to attract women to play the game. And it turns out it actually was one of the first gender crossing uh, popular games. It's a, what's called a maze chase. In this case, you're a hero in a world uh, with walls of walls, because the walls could be anything. Don't call it a maze, though. Pac-Man's the world towards... If you can't figure out how to get out of this maze, it's not really a maze, right? Collecting collectibles, which are little dots, while avoiding enemies, which are ghosts, uh, with power, with, with you power up with power-ups, which cause some special ability. This is how we break down the story. This is what, pa what Pac-Man is. Now, what are they going to do? I'm going to use the same student, because he's just really kind of a fun one. Plus, he's a little little twisted sometimes. You're a shark, so your good guy is a shark, uh, in the sea with walls made of coral, collecting fish while avoiding dolphins. The bad guys are dolphins. Uh, and you power up by eating baby seals, um, which cause double points. Interestingly enough, his power-ups do not cause any form of immunity, which really mess with people because they're so used to like going after those things. This is a really paranoid game. Uh, Let's take a quick look at this one. I say paranoid because it really... <laughs> so here I am. It gives me a nice little bit of room to play. Got to avoid the dolphins. But one of the things you're going to notice is the dolphins can move very fast. And some, and some of the areas here are dead ends. So like right now, I am trapped. And again, let me let me get killed real fast. Cause... All right. There you go. So we had a, a variety of these, which we'll get to in a second. But again, this is your standard maze chase, game number two. Now, I know I'm running out of time. I know I'm running out of time. It's amazing how quickly this thing goes, right? Game number three, I originally envisioned as Donkey Kong. Right? Because that really rounds it out, right? You've got Space Invaders, Pac-Man, and Donkey Kong. For some of you are nodding, you're like, wow, they're all my quarters. <laughs> you know? But Donkey Kong is, is very linear in some ways. And it actually, in some ways, it feels like a, a flattened out Pac-Man. If you don't actually, if you ever really analyze this, just, you know, Centipede is just Space Invaders with a little bit more room to move. I mean, these games are all really built on each other with different metaphors. So I actually really meant, when I said Donkey Kong, what I really meant was classic, the classic Mario Brothers, which is more of a mini platform with single screen, but the kids really begged, and you know, sometimes you let them, and they really wanted to go Super Mario Brothers. And, and I let him, which was a terrible mistake, and we will not be doing it again. And for Super Mario Brothers, you're a hero, Mario, trying to reach a goal. Anybody remember what the goal in Mario Brothers is? Oh my God, it's a MacGuffin. Come on, you never say, who cares? No, none of you are motivated to save the princess. Like, like you remember that, but that really isn't your motivation. Your motivation is to like get a score, beat your time, right? Uh, you're trying to reach a goal, shooting sometimes hero projectiles while collecting a variety of collectibles and avoiding enemies that may or may not be shooting enemies in a world made of platforms. All right, let's keep going. So here's one of my students' work. You're a chef trying to reach a customer Again, let's really pretend exactly what it is, trying to reach the end of the level. Shooting fireballs while collecting french fries and avoiding potatoes that shoot nothing in space with platform made of onion rings. I have, I have to point out that with his specifically, a uh, bare portion of the onion rings would be, de would, would be dead spots. Now, this is the video he had done for me in his fall semester. Okay, come on.
So this is just in his mind. I just have to let it play out because I love the, the potato wearing the uh, the chef's hat. So, did it work? Well, the reason that we were we ran into problems here was it was outside of the scope of the technology we were using, as well as the amount of time he had left. So I point this out because we're going to scale back a little bit. But this is uh, let's see if I can get it to load. Sometimes it loads, sometimes it doesn't because HTML5 uh, this one really gets the limits of it. Ooh, let's see what we're going to have. Oh no, no background which makes it really weird. But he did actually draw it, and uh, again, it's very weird when you don't have a background. Uh, okay, so I'm going to show you one other video of what the students conceptualize, but we, again, and I think this is an important, uh, uh, ex oops, let's just let it play. Oh. It's important to point out what the students conceptualize and can execute have to balance. We have to make sure that they can actually do both of them. And because this is the first time, the, the fact that they will make these videos, and I'm going to let this one play because this was, I told her she had to make this game. And she got pretty far in it. Um, not as far as I'd like. I just want the t-shirts. Um. So in conclusion, <laughs> follow this maze. Now, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is, is that I think we can learn a lot by stepping back, that encouraging our students to work in simpler but accomplishable goals. And what's really funny about this is the sophomores all walked out with these three, these three games. They're actually walking home this semester. They're going to come home with a board game uh, and two card games that are playable and produced. And then they're very excited because they're going to go home over break and go, look what I did. Now look what I talked about doing. And it's great that they made the videos, but then the fact that they were able to implement. So we do this by scaling back, by remi reminding everybody that there was a time when people didn't always work in teams. Because uh, they're going to work in teams soon enough. They're, gonna, they're, they're, they're in a team sport. And just the idea of how we can, you know, n communicate with these other, way, other things to go back to the good stuff and not think about it as just, there you go. So if you want, however, and the reason I use Prezi for all this, is that all of the student games that were playable are available online at granolagames.com. Uh, it was free, what do you want? Uh, granolagames.com, all the student games are in HTML5, so they're playable in your browser, not on your mobile device. Uh, and some of the student videos are there as well, so uh, thank you very, very much. And I now present Mace.